Hi everyone. So I thought it might be a good idea to answer some questions that I get periodically with a video here. So one of the questions that I get is how I'm able to take pictures that look as good as they do from my backyard. And uh, so one, I'm very, very flattered that, that people like the pictures that I'm taking uh, and I'm happy to, to continue taking them. I, I, I'm pretty happy with where they are so far, but I know I've still got a long way to go. But let's take an example of one that I took recently here, which is this Horsehead Nebula. Um, I'm really proud of how it turned out. Uh, and yeah, I'm taking this from my backyard uh, in Plano, Texas, which is, you know, uh, almost, I mean, on the light pollution map, it's about as bad as being in downtown Dallas. So, um, so it's not easy to take photos that are great. And obviously nothing you do is going to be as good as being in a true dark sky site. Um, but I wanted to kind of go over kind of what some of the, just the methodology is, you know, why, why are you able to take some of these kinds of shots at all um, under the kind of skies that most of us that live in, in fairly urban areas are used to. Um, so there's a, a few things on this, first of all, um, before we get into the, the actual pictures themselves, you know, a few of the things here are the kind of equipment that you're using for it, uh, to be sure. So I'm using uh, an Explore Scientific uh, 102 meter uh, scope. Um, that's not a, a huge scope, but it is it is bigger than the um, than the smallest ones out there. That that lets you more than anything else get an image taking a large enough picture of the sky to fit in the object that you're looking at, right? But after that, what I'm using is I'm using this particular camera, the ASI 294 uh, color camera. And the reason why I went to this one from the camera I had before, which was the Attic Horizon, is that when I was comparing this against some images I, I saw from friends of mine in the local astronomy club that, that had this other camera, is that they were able to just get a lot more detail coming out in their images in a shorter amount of time. And when I was doing the research, what I really found out is that this camera is just more sensitive uh, than the one that I had before. And sensitivity is a big deal in astrophotography. Obviously, you're taking you know, pictures of something over a longer exposure time. And the reason why you're doing that is you want more photons to, to hit your camera, you know, more light coming in. And so the more sensitive your camera is, the more photons it actually can catch uh, as they're coming in, which you know, means you have to expose for less time. And less time is pretty much always better if you can get away with it without sacrificing quality. After that, I'm using uh, a Celestron AVX mount, which is, is kind of an entry-level mount for um, tracking the sky uh, in, in a fashion where as the sky turns, the mount will turn with it, what's called an equatorial mount. Um, so I wanted to show you, you can take decent pictures without having to have you know, a mount that's thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, not to say that you might not upgrade to that uh, as you go down the rabbit hole, but uh, but I'm still kind of starting out on the mount side. Um, I am using guiding, although that really doesn't come into play with what I'm going to show you here today. Um, and then really a lot of it comes to two things after this, the software that you use. Um, in general, I'm going to show you guys... Um, Sequence Generator, uh, not Sequence Generator Pro. Sorry, I'm going to show you a different piece of software I'm not using in this particular uh, saved image, uh, which is SharpCap. Um, and, and then lastly, the filter. So in this particular one, I'm using a very specific filter for light pollution. Um, so obviously light pollution is all over the place, makes the sky look very gray um, when you're looking out at it. And any filter you put in front of it is actually going to reduce the amount of light you have coming in. But uh, these light pollution filters, and in this case, what's called a duo narrowband filter, will block most sources of light or many sources of light and let just some of it come through. In this case, the dual narrowband, what it's doing is it's allowing the kind of light that typically is being given off by these nebula, it allows that to come through at a fairly high percentage and then blocks out as much as it can of every other wavelength of light. 
And so while that means overall I'm not getting as much light to the camera, I'm also not getting as much of the noise to the camera. And at the end of the day, everything that you're doing with astrophotography is about signal to noise. So how much of the target that I want to get, which is the signal, am I capturing versus all the noise that I might have coming in? And those sources of noise can be from your camera itself. Uh, they can be from the uh, from things like a plane flying overhead and leaving a big streak through your image um, or just the sky glow itself. And what's the defining characteristic of noise essentially is that it's fairly random, you know, um, and, and when you say it's random, what happens is over time, you know, if you were to take uh, a picture one second and then take a picture a second afterwards, while you might still have the same amount of light pollution, it'll be in slightly different places because light jumps around a little bit. You're not going to have the same photons in the same place. But for your target, you know, let's say this star here in the field, that light is coming in at pretty much the same spot every time. You know, it'll be a little bit different due to things like the atmosphere, but once again, that'll kind of average out over time if you keep taking enough pictures. So the idea is to do what's called stacking, where you take a whole bunch of pictures of the object, and then one by one, the software goes through and kind of puts them together and averages out things so that you find out what's in the same place every time and what keeps changing or is noise. And it starts to average that noise out to the point where in some cases it disappears entirely. And in other cases, you'll find that it's dedicated to a certain part of the, uh, the light spectrum that you can actually just try to move past. So let me, let me go from this to the actual example of the raw images here. So this is SharpCap, uh, which is a great piece of software for what's called live stacking. So as I said, you'll take a whole bunch of these different pictures and historically you'd take all these pictures and then you know, each one of them might not look too great. And then you would go home the next day or later that evening and run them through software and spend hours and hours processing them. And then you would finally have an image that looked pretty good. Um, so there was a lot of hurry up and wait uh, involved. One of the nice things with SharpCap is it's really designed to kind of let you have your cake and eat it too. You can save each picture as it comes in, but it'll also do some of that heavy duty processing work on the fly as each new picture comes in uh, so that you can really kind of see this thing get better as you go. And it makes for a great way to kind of show you the examples of, of how this works. So what I have up here right now is just the raw single picture of that horsehead nebula. This is what it looks like coming off of the camera. Now, in this case, this is a 30 second exposure as opposed to a five minute exposure. But ultimately, uh, at the start off level, they really don't look that different. Um, you know, you really, what you see are the stars. You don't really see much else. So everything that, that's underneath here you know, or over in this corner over here, or over here is what's called the histogram. And this shows you all the different light that's on your frame. And it goes all the way from the very low end of zero, all the way up into something like 65,000 for, um, for a full value. So you can see most of this is pretty dark. So that's why, you know, you're only seeing a few stars. So the first thing that you'll typically do um, is you'll say, okay, well, let me let me start moving up here and say anything that's not part of this big peak where all the light was coming, anything that's this little stuff, I'm just going to move my black level up. So I'm just not even looking at it. Um, and then you'll say, okay, well, you know, I don't care about, you know, this stuff that's all black. I really care about more of what's in this peak. So then you can drag in, start dragging in this medium point. And what it's going to do is it's going to make, it's essentially doing a certain amount of math to kind of amplify what's in this peak here. And we call that stretching when we come in here. So we're kind of stretching that data out to show up on the screen better. And as I kind of pull this in more and more, 
you can start to see parts of this nebula. Now this image is flipped because of the way I was taking it uh, versus that final picture. But this was that bottom part and this is the horse head here. So it's the equivalent of this here and that there. So looking at it, this is the raw picture once you stretch it out. So boy, what a difference that makes, right? Looks great now. Nope, not really. Um, the first thing you'll notice is it's green, right? Um, it's very, very green. Uh, this isn't actually uh, the light pollution per se. What it is is just the way cameras are built, uh, especially color cameras. They uh, have... Uh, they're very sensitive to different kinds of color and they have little filters on them for a color camera that are constantly looking for red, green, and blue uh, for each, for the different pixels that they have. And the way they make these, because the human eye is more sensitive to the color green, there's twice as many green pixels, which is why looking down at this histogram, I can see my green is way up in front of my red and blue, which are down here, which puts my white of all of them combined somewhere in the middle here. So what we first thing we want to do is kind of color balance this. Uh, luckily, SharpCap kind of lets you do this automatically. So uh, here in or in SharpCap Pro, I should say. Um, here I've got a little auto color balance. So I'm just going to hit that button. You can see it changes these sliders around. And now I've got something that looks a little bit more natural. You can see it's totally gray um, all over the place here. And that is your light pollution. So if I take this back to kind of where where it was here, really looking at all of all of the real heavy data, you'll see it's just very gray. And this is what you're really dealing with, with a lot of light pollution. Now I've got that filter on, so that's already taken a good amount of it out, but you're still seeing a lot of it here. And that's really what a lot of this is over time. So how do we combat that? Well, first we do that by kind of dragging up here. The way that uh, the way that in general light is going to work in astrophotography is it's not that the light pollution is blocking the light coming in from this nebula. What it is, is it's, it's kind of adding to it. So imagine if I had three blue marbles and I just kind of set them in a glass jar. Then I ask you, what do you have there? Or what do I have here? And you'd say, oh, you got three blue marbles. Very easy to tell, right? Now imagine that I fill that jar up, I empty it out and I fill it up with red marbles and then put the three blue marbles on top. And I say, now what do I have here? You'd say, oh, you've got a jar full of red marbles and a couple of blue ones, right? And, and the same amount of blue marbles came in. What we have to do is, is essentially pass all of the red marbles. So in this case, the red marbles are our light pollution, and that's all back here and the first part of these big humps. And everything that I'm looking for in my nebula is more in this range coming down that hump. So no matter how much light pollution you have, the light is still coming in as long as you don't have something like clouds or something like that uh, that's scattering the light coming in. So, you know, let's go ahead and just try to do this. We'll go ahead and try to get past that hump and we'll just try to stretch the parts coming down here. So I've gone ahead, coming now, you know, if you look at the, the white hump, I'm actually over past the peak of it, which is really where the most of the light pollution is. And then I'm really going to focus in on this down slope. And so there you go, you know, hey, let's darken it up even a little more here. Just hopefully a little bit. Further, there we go. All right, so there's my astro photo. I took it, looks great, right? Nothing's wrong with this. It looks exactly like what I have over here, right? No, we're, we're, we're not there yet. This is the first step, right? So we're able to get past a lot of the light pollution just by ignoring the first part, ignoring all of those red marbles at the bottom of my jar and focusing at what's at the top of the jar there uh, for the light that, that came in beyond just the light pollution. And that's great. But, you know, we've got a long way to go. This is a noisy image, right? And I can kind of tell there's a blob here, but even if I zoom in here, I can't really say that looks like a horse's head, right? Um, so, 
how do we start making that look better? You know, well, the first thing is you've got a lot of noise in the camera itself. So what you can do is take what's called a dark frame. You basically just have a lens cap uh, over your camera um, and take uh, about 25 or so pictures um, at the same amount of time. So this is a 30 second exposure. Um, take 25 of those with the lens cap on and then do what we're going to look at here in a second, the stacking on those exposures. So it comes up with what's the average amount of noise that just your camera has. Now I've already done that on here. So I'm going to go ahead um, and find the particular one here. It's a 30 second, 350 gain file. And I'm just going to add it in and you say it says subtract dark. So for each new picture I have coming in here, it's going to go ahead and subtract that dark file. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. And let's look at a frame, same settings. All of this is the same. Only thing is I've added in the dark subtraction file. And once we add one in here, maybe kind of hard to tell that it looks any better, but in the previous file, there were a couple little dots intermixed with this noise that were either always red or always blue, things like that. And that was some of the dark noise and hot pixels of my camera. So now that we've got that there, that's going to automatically clean up each image. But really the next thing is the power of, of stacking these things. So what it does with stacking is the computer will automatically take each new image and try to line up the stars that are in it. So, you know, each picture I take may shift a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, up or down, that kind of thing. And so it'll line them up, which is called alignment or registration, and then it'll do that math to try to average these out. Um, and so as we go, we've got one frame here, and I'm just going to step through this one at a time for the first couple and just watch what happens as it adds the second one so there's the second one already there's a lot less noise in here it got a lot sharper let's add another one a little bit sharper still let's add another one now we're at four and it's it's looking looking a whole lot better than it did before right and so what i'm going to do here is i'm just going to hit play and let this start to go got 79 30 second exposures here and we're just going to let it start to go so as it's going here stacked four five six and see the picture starting to get better each time the background's getting more and more dark uh the noise is starting to go away if you look down here what you'll see is this peak coming down stays about the same each time but all this noise you see how it's kind of randomly changing time to time yeah, and so the noise component that's here and is also kind of part of this, it's noticing that randomness and changing it each time. Now, let's look at that horse head. We're about 22 frames in. Well, that's starting to look like a horse's head. It's upside down, but, you know, that's really starting to look like something. Let's back out a little bit from here to look at the whole picture as it's going. 29 frames in. Oh, boy, that's really starting to look like an astro photo. I haven't done any other work with this. I haven't tried to monkey with the stars or anything like that. Really all I've done is automatically balance the color, subtract out my dark noise, and then just kind of mess with the sliders to be looking at the right part of the image and then tell it to just go through and stack these up. You know, take all the pictures that I've taken and go ahead and, and try to make the cleanest image possible. Now, one of the things you'll notice is this, this may look a little dark, right? Um, and that's because when I had the first image, there was still so much noise in it. In order to get something that really kind of brought this out, I really had to kind of go far down this curve. Well, maybe I don't need to do that as much now that I've taken some of that out. Now I've taken out some of that noise. Maybe I can go back kind of adjust through this a little bit you know or maybe i can get a little bit more narrow in so that the parts of the the image that i really care about like the uh kind of red nebulosity i can make that a little bit brighter just by kind of playing with these and kind of stretching them out a little bit more and this is really where a lot of the artistry in astrophotography kind of comes in is really kind of coming through here and deciding 
where where does your taste lie in the kind of color range that you're looking at and and kind of your your black points and your white points uh that kind of thing so at this point we are just about done with the images that i had in the stack there i'm just gonna play with this just a little bit and yeah there we go we're at 72 it's kind of hitting the end here because i think i was a few images ahead um but yeah, so 79 images, and once again, it's kind of upside down. I would flip this in, in post-processing. But as I really move in to look at the noise here, you can see it's pretty good. There's still obviously noise in the image, but it's a whole lot sharper than it was, and it's really just the math going back and forth of figuring out what is random in each frame and what isn't and that makes a huge difference between a single image and the one that you have right at the end and so now you know kind of taking this back out to it's kind of full view there i said it's upside down but we should have something that looks pretty close to what i've got here yeah i spent a lot more time kind of playing around with my light and dark levels and these were a little bit longer exposures because i was trying to remove even more noise but uh but that's how you can go from a pretty bad single image to something that looks pretty good by really using a combination of a little bit of filtering and a lot of math and software uh that luckily nowadays is kind of done just for you so I hope that was helpful. Um, hope that uh, helps demystify some of this and shows how even though, you know, going to a dark sky site or using a 30 meter telescope is still, you know, going to get you the absolute best, you can still get some really, really good quality images from just about any kind of, uh, of light pollution in your sky as long as you've got a clear sky. So with that, I wish all of you clear skies and we'll see you on the next one.